Hallelujah. We may be seated, Bazalwani, in the presence of the Lord. Luke 14. Luke 14. We are all reading from chapter 14 of Luke. We continue where we left off on the dinner table conversation. And from that conversation, we are drawing characteristics of a disciple of Christ. And we see how Christ was observant and how Christ was challenged uh, or tested. And he, test, he turned the test into becoming a challenge. Now, 14 of the book of Luke from 1 to 6. 14, 1 to 6. And then uh, J.B. Utorbala. I'm not going to touch this part because I've already do, have done two parts on it. Uh, a, a small highlight on it, and then I, I'm going to take up a principle from there. But before he reads, I must remind you that scripture interprets scripture. Amen? One book of the Bible based on inspiration is designed or given to us to provide interpretation of another book in the Bible. There are more than 40 authors of the Bible and among these 40 authors of the Bible we have 66 books and in these 66 books they are all inspired because scripture tells us that men who wrote were moved by the spirit that inspiration of the spirit causes then what we read to carry weight and to carry authority for faith on, on matters of faith and doctrine secondly it is important for anyone who approaches scripture to do so as a diligent student of the word amen because scripture uh, actually advises us to study, to show ourselves approved, a good workman rightly dividing the word of truth. As I've said before, if you can rightly divide it, it's also possible for you to wrongly divide it. Amen. And I see mostly because of lack of diligence in the study of God's word, uh, most people just like to preach sermons and to preach punchlines and to move with those things and then attach the word of God to their punchline in order to make their punchline valid. That's not how it works. We exegete the text so that we can draw truth from the text and meaning from the text so that at the end of it all, we can clearly from the scriptures through the correct ability of approaching scripture and teaching sound doctrine, we can hear and thus says the Lord. In our time. Amen. Scripture was therefore given to us for instructions. Now, Scripture interprets Scripture. So you can't just pick one verse, one writer, one book, and then you think you know the Bible. You, the Bible forces you to know all the 66 books. So that, based on that, you, could, you can be at a place where you are a diligent uh, a student of the word who ensures that you do not make the error of allowing another author of the scriptures to contradict another author. Meanwhile, you are claiming they are both inspired by God. Scripture interprets scripture because this is the greatest rule uh, or strongest rule when it comes to interpre uh, scriptural inter interpretation because uh, it ensures that uh, what the Holy Spirit has declared to one speaker cannot contradict another speaker. Because both speakers or authors are inspired by the Holy Spirit. Secondly, context must interpret scripture. I know uh, sometimes most people rush finding proof texts. And I've always said, congratulations, you have found the verse, but regrettably you have missed the context. Now you are applying the text out of context and you are expecting to draw either a promise from it or to draw an instruction from it. 
and then you find yourself misapplying the text. So your application is going to be wrong if your doctrine is wrong as well. Amen. And then thirdly, intent interprets scripture. When the Holy Spirit inspired biblical writers, when they wrote, there was a specific intention. They intended to communicate certain things, but unfortunately in our generation, we take that for granted, and as a result of that, we end up with different meanings of scripture, of the same text, and that is actually wrong, Bazalwan. Amen. So, we are just going to allow these verses to speak to us. And I know it gets to be, for somebody who's used to some power, explosive, get ready type of a message, it sounds boring because it sounds like lecturing. But the truth of the matter is that he did not only give us evangelists, right? He gave us apostles, he gave us prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And as we receive these graces, we are going to receive the full impartation of these graces that are given for the purpose of uh, ensuring that the church comes into full maturity. Amen. So, verse 1 until 6, that's the first section in this text. Uh, let's read it quickly so I can pass. Uh, Luke 14, verse 1. And it came to pass as he went into the house of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day that they washed him. And behold, there was a certain man before him which had the drops. And Jesus answering spake unto the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? And they held their peace, and he took him, and he healed him, and let him go. And answered them, saying, Which of you shall have an ass or an ox fallen into a pit, and will not straight away pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could not answer him again to these things. Amen. Now, here's the scenario, and we get the scenario from Scripture. Jesus is invited into a house of a prominent Pharisee on the Sabbath day. And in that invitation, I don't think the sick guy was invited. Somehow, some people saw it fit to have the sick person come into that room. Most scholars believe that the intention was to test Jesus. We take that from the account from this text that says, and they washed him. In other words, as much as he's going to do his own observations concerning the dinner table conversation, they are also going to watch him. They want to watch to see what he will do. But guess what they did? They brought a sick man on the Sabbath day, and they know, according to the traditions of the Jews, that if you heal the sick on the Sabbath day, you will be in trouble with those who are watchdogs for religion or rules. But Jesus being compassionate. Jesus who shows that he loves people more than rules. He turned that test into becoming a challenge. And he asked them, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? Another way to put it, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath day? And then he challenges them. If your cow falls into a ditch or anything bad happens to something that has value to you, what do you do? Are you not working on the Sabbath? And I've always said this. God commanded rest without prescribing what is work. As a result of that, they ended up with a thousand rules trying to prescribe what is work so that they don't break the Sabbath. And as a result of that, they ended up with the traditions of the Pharisees. And unfortunately, this is what these traditions of the elders did. They ended up being equated to Scripture. That when you break... What the elders have said, it was tantamount to you breaking what God has said. That is why in Matthew 15, Jesus comes later and says, uh, your man-made rules, your man-made commandments made the word of God of none effect. On their way of trying to obey God, uh, uh, they had fence laws. In order to trace these laws, uh, you, you, you'd find them according to the Mishnah. Uh, these are the laws that were codified. And in order for you to go back to trace them uh, correctly, you would go back into the time of Ezra. They will set them as uh, 
fence laws. These fence laws were mainly for the synagogue to ensure that uh, before you break the law of God, you break the law before that. And then, unfortunately, the law they put to ensure that you don't break the law of God be, it, be, uh, came to a, a time came a time where it, be, it was equated to becoming equal to the law of God. As a result of that, it was now binding to the people. There is nothing that forbids healing on the Sabbath day. But if somebody assumes treating someone who is sick on the Sabbath is work, then you are in trouble. So Jesus was like, I'm going, to, I'm going to show compassion. And I'm going to challenge those who are going to question what I'm doing as work. And I'm going to ask them, is it lawful to heal? Do you see where he's going? Is it lawful to heal? Why is he saying lawful to heal? Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath? Just like you do on your animals. And as much as you value them, I also value my people. That even on a day that you deem not authorized for work, I will do good on the Sabbath. Because doing good on the Sabbath does not necessarily break it, it fulfills it. And then he adds a statement that qualifies these things in other texts. He says to them that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And then he qualifies it even more in more stronger terms. He says, he is the Lord of the Sabbath, meaning he can do whatever he likes on the Sabbath day because he's the one that authorizes it, what is work and what is not work. Come on, Soma, uh, Jesus uh, is not uh, in a place where he, he, is, he, he needs to be told what is work on the Sabbath. He needs to tell what is work on the Sabbath. So, by seeing that test, from that test, in that dinner table conversation, in, an, in a home environment, he challenged them, and after challenging them, he began to do a contrast. And this is a contrast where we learn lessons concerning discipleship. He says, they focus more as the Pharisees on rules and protocol. I focus more on compassion. And he says, I'm teaching you as my disciples then, that a characteristic of a disciple of Christ is to honor and to value people and to love people and to prioritize people more than you prioritize rules. So he's actually saying, unlike the Pharisees who are in this house, who have put me in a test, who can't answer uh, and when I challenge them, my disciples are going to def behave differently. Our attitude should be, we should love people. So, a characteristics that we draw from these uh, texts in this first section, one to six, we ought to love people the master did less. He's teaching something very important. Now, the question is, do we love people beyond our protocols? What, okay, let me bring it home. What if you get a call at a time where your rules do not admit for you to receive that call. What happens when your own standards are inconvenienced versus saving a life or helping a friend? Jesus says, you must be known by the people who will break your own protocols, whether as individuals or as groups or as organizations, in order to ensure that you accommodate mankind. Because men is more important to God than days. So Jesus healed the man, and guess what he did to the day? That the, because they set the day as an offense. He healed the man. After healing the man, he explained the day. Case closed. Praise the Lord. A good principle for us to learn. So what should characterize us? Loving people. Now the question is, have we loved people or our rules are already setting up walls against people? So we need to remove the walls and start loving people. Praise the Lord. So Jesus is breaking. And here's the thing. There's no two way about it. It's either you have the attitude of the tendency of the Pharisees. It's either you continue to showcase the courtesies of the Pharisees or you show the character of a disciple of Christ. What 
fruit are we producing? Are we producing fruit of just order in how we dress, order in how we talk, order in how we present ourselves, yet we ignore the pressing needs of mankind that God brings to us on a daily basis? What characterizes you as a disciple? So this is not about coming to church. It's about how you behave on a daily basis. Christ is challenging them. And he's challenging them in an environment that is hostile, and he's, they are just sitting, and he's challenging them. He's not shouting. He's really, really challenging the way they do things versus the way he would have them do things. He says the Pharisees, they normally do this. My disciples don't do this. And there's no gray area about it. Today, based on how you behave, you are either a Pharisee or a disciple. Which one are you? A toughne? Amen. This is the kind of truth that you should receive and be sober when you receive this kind of truth. Rules of the days were broken so that one man can receive favor and healing. Would you be offended that your protocol was disregarded versus celebrating a man who is healed? You don't hear anything in this text of them celebrating the man. Instead, you, also, you actually hear Jesus says, and he sent the man away because they never had praise for his work. They had uh, uh, an attitude that was thinking more about what about the people who know us to be Pharisees and who know us to be important people. What are they going to say when they see us break the rules of the day? So because you, are, you have a fixation with rules, you will never praise God for his works. And you'll always be praying prayers like God sent people to us, but you don't love those people. God do this. Oh God, we want a revival. The revival must begin with breaking your rules so that you can open a door where you used not to open a door, where you had your own standards. God says break your standards. What, is, what if breaking your rule means starting a home cell right in your living room? Stuff that you will not do in that private space of yours because it has become so holy and sacred. An unbeliever cannot enter that space to be safe. It has become a space for you to impress God, a space for you to receive the infilling without the outflowing of that infilling to save lives. When God challenges you. So before we make it about the Pharisees, don't we have the courtesies as well of the Pharisees in our time and day by having this attitude that because we are right with God, everyone outside of God cannot enter into our sacred places because we have already drawn the holy of holies rules against them. So they cannot enter. They end up not even in your outer court. They, they can't even be your friend on Facebook because you have, a, you have a certain class of people that are your friends, certain people that you, are, you cannot be associated with. What do you think about Jesus being with that woman at the well? What do you, you would think uh, the, the disciples were thinking that Jesus is with a woman? Today, those things that you treat with suspect, Jesus uh, uh, actually bypassed those things. I don't care how, about what you think, but I'm more concerned about who I'm saving. So saving souls and winning souls involves breaking some rules of the things we do as a norm in the church. Can we break walls? Somebody say amen. amen. Mm -hmm. We are challenged every Sunday, every day, every time you stand in the robot and there's a poor guy asking you for money. Your conscience goes through 17 different directions. Is he, is he playing with me? Is it real? Must I take out my money? Or, and many other things. And I know they are actually crooks. That is why uh, most of the children of God should be led. Actually, children of God must be led by the Spirit. So give based on leadership, not on what you see that day. Amen. Breaking rules. If we can break rules, I tell you, there will be revival. Healings will happen. Why are there are no healings? It's not that we are not praying for the power of God. It's because we are in environments that have made it impossible for healings to happen. So that when a sick person comes into that environment, we feel embarrassed. They stink. They are not dressed properly. We don't want to associate. We, we like, hey, if you're learning, save this. But Jesus with compassion. What happened to our compassion? 
Do you remember where the Lord took you? How God saved you, the things he saved you from. Today, when those things are associated with other people, because it is no longer your, it is no longer your present context, you are judging them. But if we all take each one of us back to the past, we are like those unbelievers, or even worse. Love people. Stop making salvation something you have control over. Controlling it with programs, controlling it with services, controlling it with uh, things you plan to do. We ought to be led by the Spirit of God. And when this happens, he's going to break our comfort zone. And he's going to ensure that he challenges us for real to do things that we will not normally do. So I'm saying to you, part of the reason why healings and revivals are not taking place is because, like the Pharisees, we have our order in place that cannot allow certain things to take place. And I also want to address this generation of people that keep on dealing with issues of scripture, you know, advocate for scripture, but deny the power thereof. That God, when God does a healing because you did not authorize it and because you cannot explain it. Some people want to explain, they want to explain a miracle. That's how far they want to go in lecturing things of God. They even want to explain sovereignty when, when in that explanation of sovereignty, what if it, the sovereign God chooses to heal then? How would you explain him healing in an environment that is not conducive for your teaching? Because if he's sovereign, then he can do whatever he likes then. So why don't you let him lose? The wind blows where it listed. We do not know where it comes from. We do not know where it goes. We follow the sound. So can you be that open in the things of the spirit to allow the spirit of God to do stuff that will even surprise you? Is there anything too hard for God? We have become complacent, comfortable in explaining the power of God than in allowing the power of God to be demonstrated. Somebody say amen. amen. So guess what? They did not even celebrate the guy. Jesus healed the guy and said, he sent him away. If you read, he said he sent him away because the congregation could not celebrate that miracle. May God make the Pharisees of our time uncomfortable with what they think they know. That is why I don't believe in cessationism in any form or shape. I understand, I've studied that, and I'm, I'm okay with it. But I don't believe that the God who is in heaven, the almighty God, has stopped performing mighty wonders through certain vessels. The, there are extremes. The extremes on the charismatic guys is sensationalism. The extreme on the Calvinist guys, let me mention them, is cessationism. It is an extreme. It's not completely biblical, that thing. Because you have to feed it into a certain context to accommodate your group. And then you stifle the power of God. And guess what you are doing? You are quenching the spirit fire. How did they do ordination? The spirit of God lead, leading them. How did they win cities for God? The spirit of God. Tina, we are doing uh, missionary programs that are organized. Pre well prepared. Where is spontaneity? Where is God moving spontaneously and doing things in our midst? And we are shocked that something happened suddenly, like a sound of a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the house. And as Paul was preaching, he could feel that a certain man had failed to be healed. Where is that dimension? And I know other people have relegated to the close of Canaan because they don't want to allow the Spirit of God to lead them in things that are uncomfortable for them to do. I have said things that I was not sure about and I was amazed how the Spirit of God went without taking credit. Yes, God is the one who heals. The problem is that when the person who, 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 who has functioned in a specific gift tries to own that thing now, then it becomes a problem. May God help us. The gifts of the Spirit are still continuing. God can do anything now. God can speak concerning someone's situation, disrupt the sermon and get to his own business. His, uh, by the way, it's his house, isn't it? And the Bible says his house shall become a house of what? Of prayer. So if the Spirit of God begins to move, we follow, we don't question. Let's go to the second section. Section of the term, from verse 7 until 12. Read. And he put forth 
the parable to those which were there yeah. when he marked how they chose out the chief rules, saying unto them, mm. When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, mm. lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. And he that bade thee, and he come and say to thee, Give this man to the place, and thou shalt begin with shame to take the lowest room. But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, Friend, go up higher, then thou shalt have worship in the presence of them that sit and meet with thee. Mm -hmm. For whosoever exalted himself shall be abased, mm -hmm. and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Amen. Can we all say this? Whosoever exalt himself, and this is not church context, anywhere, everywhere, whosoever exalt himself will be humbled. And whosoever humbles himself will be what? Jesus is talking about an attitude. In any environment, consider yourself less. When you do that, you are not going to be offended when the best seat is not given to you. You know why? Because only the one who is the host knows who is the greatest in the room. The host has a guest list. He knows that this one comes first and this one comes second. So the minute you are second in the guest list and you act like first, you will be humbled by the guest list. When the host announces that actually there is someone more important that should have that seat. So since you have taken that seat, please move. From just sitting, this is a dinner table conversation. Uh, Jesus is identifying pride from sitting. Not from preaching, not from teaching, not from giving, not from doing any exploits for God. The way they sit, he identifies pride. Have you ever been in that place where what you thought you deserved was not given to you because you took it first? It, it would have come to you. But now you, you are being humbled about it. Have you ever thought that, have you ever been in that place where you think I'm best at something until God brings something better? Because God is the one on his list. He knows who has the best thing. So since you are not the host, you don't know how the list looks like. Follow the instructions on, in terms of sitting like in weddings. I know in weddings they have that table, but the table elekia family, table elekia makoti lemukonyana. That table is for the friends. The table sit on the wrong table well. Bautolo utu udutsi moy. Your name will be announced. They will announce it like they are announcing a car that is not proper. They will announce your name. We apologize. The pastors are supposed to actually be sitting where my brother is actually sitting. We sorry guys. We. We know sometimes let's observe the, the 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 humiliation of being removed. It's one thing to remove yourself, ne? it's another when somebody removes you. It's like they strip your dignity in public. So Jesus says, as he was observing in the dinner table, everyone thinks they are more important than the other person. So when they come in, they all go for the best seat. Only to find that only the guest list will the host list will reveal who is the best. And then if you sit in a place that's not befitting for you, you will be removed with humiliation. Amen. So, are we pay wabewa? Hmm? You, you, you don't even send yourself, you allow God to send you. You wait to be seated. Yes, you wait to be seated. So, in this section, Jesus is teaching two things. He says, the way they approach seeds, the Pharisees, they do it with pride. The way you approach seeds, as my disciples, have a posture, an attitude of humility. How do I know my disciples? Jesus says, humility. And if you insist of continuing in pride, pride comes before the fall. Somebody will bring you down very soon. 
The more humble you walk in your humble ways, being high and lifted up and lofty in your dealings and in your doings. Without understanding that verse, Paul, that Paul says, let no man think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but let everyone think soberly. You know, rather be nothing, and you, then you are told you are something. That you think you are something, only to be proven that you are nothing. Seats. Second section, characteristics of a disciple. Let's move to 15 to 24. We are getting what should characterize the disciples of Christ. One, love for people than for rules. We are getting what should characterize the disciples of Christ. Humility instead of a sense of self-importance. You know, knowing that you've got the accolades, you humble yourself until somebody promotes you. Have you ever seen that the day you come to a place where you, have, you think you have arrived, God will always send faithful people to prove that you are last on the list, you are not first. God has a way of ensuring that the, the first become the last and the last become the first. So don't rush for being important anyway. It's only dangerous in my generation that um, other people unfortunately have clothes of importance. They know themselves. Amen. <laughs> they don't want us to talk about these things. They can talk anything they want, about anything they want, and nobody should take offense. But when they are confronted with the truth of their behavior, they take offense. There are clothes of ministry. And these clothes of ministry have become clothes of authority. They came under the notion that these are clothes of order until they become clothes of honor and authority. That if I'm dressed a certain way, you're supposed to know where I must sit. And this is the order of the Gentiles and the world, not the kingdom of God. It's supposed to become the fruit of my ministry that brings me into function and grace with God's people. When I sense something greater, I should be able to say I decrease so that you may increase. I should not demand honor. I should receive it as others people recognize me as I serve. Mm. We should stop honoring people who are not serving. We only honor those who serve because their authority is revealed when they serve, not when they demand honor in the name of serving. It should, we should get the context right, correct? Let's hear the parable. Then he said to him who invited him, When you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, your rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back and you be repaid. All right, just, just hold on to that. We are sitting, they are sitting in a dinner table conversation. Jesus is, is challenged. Jesus is tested, he challenges. Jesus deals with the principle of the Sabbath. Jesus, on two sections of Luke 14, deals with the guest first, the attitude of the guest. The guest came with some test. The guest were running for the front seat. So Jesus dealt with them. Now the second section uh, deals more with the host, the attitude of the host, the one who invites. Now after addressing the guest, what's a Jesus name? It's called that are going opposite the kingdom of God. So he has to align them as the king of the kingdom. Because by the way, I mean, it's good to be corrected by someone whose kingdom is higher than yours. So he knows that we don't do this in the heavenlies. We don't act like this. The equality that exists in the Godhead, the harmony that exists in the Godhead, the unity that exists in the Godhead, the plurality and the divinity that exists in the Godhead, we do not behave ourselves this way. So he begins to align. He's aligning them, he's aligning this guy in his own house. He dealt with the guest's attitude. Now he's dealing with the host. He says, Mr. Host, also and you also. The problem is with you is that when you were inviting all of us here, 
you had your best guys on the list. You know why you had your best guys? It's so that it can promote you. So that tomorrow, when they do their own feasts, they also invite you. So it is like you were loaning yourself. They pay you back. And then he says, when you invite in the kingdom of God to prove that you are a servant, you don't go for the best in your list. You go for the least. Because those one will benefit and you will never get anything in return. True servanthood is when you serve and you know you are not going to get anything in return. Whether it be honor or glory or benefit, you serve with the intent to benefit someone and without expecting anything in return. So any form of servanthood that's going to benefit you, you did not serve, you were in the business. You were on a transaction with your friends that I did you this favor, you are also going to do me this favor. So he has just addressed, addressed the guests, now he's addressing the host who says, this meeting as it is, it is a meeting that's going to pay you back. That's why it is not a good meeting. If you wanted to invite, you are supposed to look for, for the lame. That is why a lame guy walked into your house and he became a challenge and a test instead of him becoming a testimony because we had a point to prove to your guest without being sensitive to someone who's undergoing trouble. Do you see that? So Jesus actually, they're sitting, Mara, he's dealing with things that you would ignore. And think, of, what is he talking about here? He's actually talking about the attitude of the heart. You invite me so I can invite you. So that is not an invitation. You invite those that can repay you, so that's not an invitation. You invite the select of the elect and the ones that are on top so that they can make you look good on the poster. So that is not an invitation. If you invite and you are in the kingdom mission, you are going to look for people that are not going to give you anything in return. Instead, you are going to selflessly spend yourself upon them. Host, guest. So, he then says to the disciples, you guys, when you invite, do it like a real servant. Don't do it like an expert. Invite like a servant. Don't invite like an expert. When you invite, look for people that can benefit from what you do without you getting anything in return. Hmm. It judges a whole lot of things in how we do things. But guess what Jesus is doing here? He's merely checking our motives, why we do certain things. He checks the motives of the heart. He says, when a host, you did all of this because you wanted to get something in return. So that the one who is important on your guest list, when they do something, they will call you back on. So what is he teaching? Servanthood, that true servanthood is not just being called a servant. True servanthood has to do with attitude also. And the attitude of true servanthood is, I do this and I don't expect anything in return. How many of us serve for recognition? If we serve for recognition, you already have your reward. Did, did the pastor see what I did? You already have your, your reward. That is why you are not, you are offended. Have you ever seen in conferences in churches, uh, that lady that later comes after the, the conference and does announcement, he does announcements, and then he mentions people on the list. Family, you've been wonderful, guys. Family, I'm Kwanazi. Thank you for the chairs. Family, uh, I'm mm, Rock. Yeah, thank you. Thank you guys for your, your giving and stuff. And then they forget Family, I'm Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. Family, I'm Not being mentioned on the Thanksgiving announcement. Will not come to church the next Sunday, the next Sunday. Because they were doing it for the men of God. They were doing it for recognition. And this is what Jesus discourages. Even if your name is not mentioned, God has seen what you have done. He should be the one getting the glory. That's why churches are in a mess right now 
because people are doing it for recognition. You don't do it for recognition. You don't do anything for recognition. But if you do it with the right heart, the house will recognize you. There will be recognition. The body will recognize you. grace in this thing. The invitation comes because the body knows its members. The body that knows that this is the nose, head, this is the nose, this is the mouth. So if you keep on serving in the body, the body will identify who you are based on serving. You don't announce. I would also announce. Sorry, I am a powerful man of God. Oh, powerful. I go do the fact to serve. I do the more fact to serve. I would not serve a more. Yeah, rich or no, no, your prelude was like, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. hey, hey, man, yeah, amen. Mm -hmm. And when you think you are the best, God brings someone who's going to do a little bit better prelude than yours on a day where you over prepared. <laughs> yeah, I get to get about, get about so over prepared, and then put the MC Arnago. What I want to say, and this lady is already removing me, the kind of offense, and you are going to call all of that jealous because you did it with a motive to be seen. There are many tendencies of the Pharisees that we have, that we show and we are not aware. Because the attitude is serving to receive something in return. Sometimes God is going to offend you by not appointing you. Or not choosing you. What happened to Cain and Abel? God was favorable to one and visited the one he was not favorable to. He said, if you do good also, you will. Only to find out the opportunity that was presented was for a, cali a caliber of people, a different, a, a certain class of people who have the expertise in that area. If you were given that place, you will be found wanting and embarrassed and making excuses as a result. So, wait to be seated, love people, and ensure that when you serve, you do it without any motive of getting anything in return so that you don't get offended when people say, don't say to you thank you you know there are people who are crying for a thank you you already have your reward that's what you're looking for Alice. thank you what your left does on the right the other one must not know selflessness is the characteristics of the disciple of Christ the one that rewards you is in in heaven whether your name is mentioned whether you are the one who is on the forefront whether you participate or not whatever you do do it with the right motive Jesus is emphasizing that Amen. and he's doing that on a dinner table conversation this is a meaningful conversation that deals with attitudes of the heart Okay, the last part. In fact, let me paraphrase it for time because keep at Lahore, Uskipe to verse 25. We're not going to go verse 25. Yeah. So now, the second part, Jesus, in fact, the third part, Jesus engages into a parable again. And he says to the host again. He says to the host, as he is preparing for a meeting to call people into a feast, he goes one by one to his important guests. And each one of them, they decline the invitation. And all of them are using reasons, H and B. And then eventually Jesus engages the teaching to say, uh, if these three guys are not coming, these three guys that are important for you are not coming, invite everybody. And Jesus is saying, that is what you have done as a host. You will invite people that are important to you and they will not be available on that day. What do you do then? Your attitude as a host should be that everyone is welcome. And then you do not invite based on class and standard, a title. You invite people who are rejected because especially in a Jesu Wibuela, but to assignment, people with assignments in this house. 
If you have an assignment for God, that assignment is for people that were rejected. You can't beef up your assignment with people who belong to other people's assignments. There is a group of people of your assignment, but you are not inviting them because also your invitation has the issue of glorifying you somehow. So please understand, Jesus is serious about going out to invite the despised because that's where you're going to see the power of God. Because when your friends who are important come, they are going to say, there's a defect on the pulpit. The food was not nice. I was not given this thing early. I did not have what what. You are going to have the stress of the meeting. But if you invited people who appreciate, you give them crumbs, they are going to begin to celebrate. Your invitation is going to be full of people who appreciate and then you are going to fulfill your assignment with impact. Then end it with a lot of judging because you invited people that were not meant for that invitation. Get dinner table conversation. So when you invite, ask the Lord to show you the rejected, the despised, so that you focus on impacting people of your assignment. Verse 25. Now great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them, Wait, wait. On verse 25, we are shifting into a new section. In this new section, what happens, Jesus is going to now address the cost of discipleship. And then he begins by saying this. A great multitude, in fact, let's all say it. A great multitude, a great multitude followed him. A great multitude, a great multitude followed him. Followed. Read it for us in verse 25. Because sometimes we rush, ne? I keep at the rush. Let's go to verse 25. Now great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them. Mm. It's okay to have fans. And they follow you because they are fans. Baba and Kuban, they got a miracle. Others got a prophecy. Others want to be associated with that grace. Many other things why people fall. But Jesus is actually saying, there's only one group of people. There's a one, there are, there are people that are with him. There are people that are following him. There's a difference. The ones that are with him, others are with him because they saw him perform a miracle. Others are with him because he turned uh, 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 those uh, uh, two, two fish uh, and, and five loaves and fed the multitude because they are hungry. They are with him because of what he's capable of. They are with him because of what they can receive from him. And he begins to set a standard. He says, I'm going to show you the difference uh, of who I qualify to follow me. It's not everyone who follows me. And guess who he's addressing? He's addressing the people that he's with. He's saying, the multitudes that you see here, <laughs> most of them are fans. Let's put them to the test. And then the test is, if anyone wants to follow me, let him take up his cross. They know what the cross means to the Roman they know what it means. A humiliating death. They know what it means to die shamelessly. They know what it means, death to self. He says, guys who are following me for miracles and this and this and this, let's put it to the test. Let's get you to a place where you are following me by giving me something, not by you getting something. And guess what? I want you to give me. I want you to give me your life. Then only you can become my disciples. If you can't give me your life, you are just a fan. That is why the house of the Lord, there's a high possibility that most, some of the people we call Christians are just fans and followers because of certain reasons. They are not really disciples of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That is why when they are confronted with truth, they take offense because they never died to self in the first place. They never picked up the cross. So what will the Roman do versus what Jesus will do concerning the cross? The Roman will say, pick up the cross by force. Jesus was instructed to pick up the cross by force. They even asked Simon to pick it up on his behalf by force. And then guess what he will carry? He will carry 
the horizontal beam of the cross while the vertical beam is already at the place of crucifixion called God. Do you see what is happening? When you take up the cross, you are not taking the vertical, you are taking the horizontal. In other words, you are going to carry that part where people are going to see your humiliation before your life can fully glorify God. So taking up the cross, in fact, taking up is, is, is actually Jesus' instruction. The Romans instruction says, pick up that thing. You are picking it up. So if there are many people who have, who, who have picked up the cross, but Jesus is saying, no, I don't want you to pick it up. I want you to carry it well. No one is forcing you. I want you to have your life intact. We in Sibori, I'm so and so, I'm important. And then after knowing that you are important, you then take that importance, put it down, and then carry the humiliation of knowing that for you to be my disciple, you must die to self and then follow me. Then ask the question to the crowd, who among you is my disciple? People thought that grace is, 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 is cheap. It's not cheap. Grace is free, but it is not cheap. When you become a child of God, you lose something. And guess what you lose? You lose everything. You don't just sing, I surrender all. You live a surrendered life. How many of us are disciples? That is why it won't be an issue of a struggle concerning holiness and stuff. Because first, you carry the cross and you followed him willingly. You did not die like a chicken, refusing to die. You know when a headless chicken goes around thinking it's still okay until it falls. Most Christians die like chickens in discipleship. They don't want to die, just die. You are called to death. Christianity changes your name, your nature, your everything. It even changes your, your lineage. Spiritual lineage changes. You now belong to Christ and you are sold out for Christ and you are for Christ. And guess what? Christianity does not leave you uh, with freedom without being a slave. It sounds like a paradox. Christianity provides your freedom and invites you into slavery willingly. Hore, <laughs> bro, you are free. But that freedom comes with responsibility. Amen. And then guess what he says? To challenge them further, I'm just continuing with the verse. To challenge them further, he says to them, guys, if anyone wants to follow me, he must hate his father and mother. Hate? That's a very tough word. Hate father and mother. If you follow me, hate father and mother. Now let's focus on the text. The word hate there, the word hate there is used as a figure of speech. Okay? Don't be preoccupied with the literal. It's a figure of speech in the text. It is a way of saying I love something more than something else. Not that I hate something to the detriment of the other. Do you understand? Like God saying, Esau have I hated, Jacob have I loved. Figure of speech. What is he saying there? He's simply saying, I, I, I love more, I love more Jacob than I love Esau. He does not mean he hates Esau. He says he loves more. So it should be a comparison of love, not a command of hate. Do you see that? So he says, he who hates his mother, father, now he counts all of them mother, father. So really, if you become a disciple of Christ, you lose the people that are close to you. Things that are sentimental to you. And Christ says, I want that. And then, while they are like, what is he talking about? He goes even further, and I close with this one. He goes even further, and he says to them, let me show you, let's use economic terms. To describe what do I mean by the cost of discipleship and then he begins to say a man who builds a house must count the cost he who builds the house must count it in other words he who says wants to be my disciple must count the cost and he begins to give us scenarios to say a man started to build a house lay down the foundation how 
and then put everything in place and the minute people see the foundation Jesus was actually saying he's giving them an example an illustration he says to them that man was pretending to afford based on the magnificent foundation he laid he was pretending to afford but to show that he really afford he must finish that house and then he says this man starts building this house and then he does not finish building house it meant it means he pretended as if he's affording only to be found wanting so that is what many people are doing in relation to discipleship they come to Christ they pretend as if they afford this lifestyle of following the Lord and if they don't finish we will know that they were not disciples but pretenders they were acting like many people we think are disciples are just pre pretenders this is what he's teaching in this text. The cost of discipleship to say grace is free, but it is not cheap. In other words, when you follow Christ, there are some decisions that you are going to make. I will serve no foreign gods, nor any other treasure. It's a no-go area. I am not playing with that decision. I'm not going to involve, even if I can be under pressure where I feel God is not answering a certain prayer. I've been waiting on something for God to do. It has not been, the, no matter the pressure that will come, I will serve no foreign God. When my family comes with suggestions, go, come do this, bring this together. And I will serve no foreign God, no any other treasure. Now, if you stand your ground based on such decision concerning God and what you choose, God says, that is my disciple. So don't worry, on a daily basis, you are proven whether you are a disciple of Christ or not. But a true disciple of Christ pays the price. Because the world hated him, it will hate you also. The world humiliated him, they will humiliate you also. They will make you feel like you do not belong. So I urge you and beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God. That as long as you are in this world, never try to live on the standards of this world. You'll be disappointed. There are certain things that are just going to come as a sacrifice. Discipleship is sacrificial life. Discipleship is surrendered life. Discipleship also shows characteristics like we have seen. That are totally opposite from how the Pharisees act like or behave themselves in the things of God. So with these words, remember to love one another and to love others and to prioritize others, just like we were commanded. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as you love yourself. This is the commandment actually that fulfills the entire law. Second, humility. Somebody put it very well by saying, it is not human to be humble, you choose. All of us have that I'm important because whether we are dignified human beings and stuff like that. You have to tell yourself, I don't want to look or think of myself more highly than I ought to think. I'm also going to think so badly. Thirdly, when you serve, make sure that you don't intend to benefit and you don't do it for recognition. The fourth thing, ensure that as you continue in the things of God, you choose the most despised. You don't invite according to status and class. You invite according to need so that God can have an opportunity through the abundance in your life to change other people's lives. And then don't forget, don't be part of the crowd. Can't afford to be part of the crowd because being part of the crowd does not define you as a disciple, but making decisions to follow him will cost you and as you make those decisions when the world is going south and you go west, that will become proof that you are his disciple. Lastly, do not be a pretender. Don't pretend that you've got all this figured out. Because if there's anything that Jesus hates more than anything, is hypocrisy. Christianity can't just be for you coming to church on Sunday. When Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, look like the world, but your Sunday looks like heaven then there's a serious problem. Be a child of God if you are a child of God. Because the seed of God in you, the seed 
the born again seed of God in you that transformed you and made you a child of God. It is that seed that has power to overcome the world. He that overcomes the world. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. You ought to be different. That's another term to mean to be holy. There's something about you as a child of God that should announce is different. You can't just look like the world and claim to be a servant of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They will not love you as a result because in fact they hated him. As a result, they will also hate you. So please understand, you are in this world, but you are not of this world. Remember your citizenship. Remember what you are living for. You are not living for men's praise and accolades. You are living for his glory. When you pray and you do it privately, make sure that you don't do it to be seen by men. When you make gifts and giving alms, don't take your camera with you when you do that to the poor because you are doing it for your Father in heaven. He must be the one seeing it. He must be the one knowing that you are taking care of people in Ethiopia and Mozambique in any other area. God must be the one seeing it. The minute you become the person that announces it, brothers and sisters, you already have your reward. So we are called into serious virtues. And these virtues are heaven. Why are they, they seem to be difficult? Because they represent what we call the image of God. Something we lost in Eden, recovered in Christ, and God is trying to build it up in our lives today. Can you be a child of God? Behold what manner of love the Father has given to us. The greatest thing that you've ever been called is that you are a child of God, and which simply means you are different. Do the works of your Father in heaven, and do them while it's still day. Because when night comes, you will never have an opportunity. When you walk, walk circumspectly, accurately. But Zolwan, stop being busy bodies. Don't go where you are not supposed to go. For no reason of going. Stay at home, man. Sleep. Be bored, girl. But don't be in wrong places. Make sure that you walk circumspectly. Circumspectly means walk accurately. Because you are redeeming the time. Because the days are evil. Kiwana pulu soyo, mudi malton lofatsi.